Hello, and welcome to the Citizen Under Siege Products Project's Fall 2016 webinar series, Clashes Over Citizenship, Promoting Learning, Listening, and Engagement. We are so glad that you could join us in this timely webinar and do appreciate your time. My name is Virtus Robinson, and I'm the Interim National Manager of the Democracy Commitment, aka TDC. And I'm joined by my cohort, Dr. Karen Matai Muzo, who is the Senior Director of Civic Learning and Democracy Initiatives at the um, Association of American Colleges and Universities. Hello, Karen. everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. We are delighted to, that you've joined us. Thank you, Virtus, for welcoming us. This is the first in our series of three. And as you know, our topic today is from fractious differences to engage dialogues. We're going to examine how texts and techniques from the humanities disrupt unexamined positions, put human faces to abstract ideas, and help open up spaces where dialogue and consensus might emerge on historic and contemporary questions. Um, we'll also be describing some of the models that make that engagement possible. Uh, this series is sponsored by the Association of American Colleges and Universities, the leading national association concerned with equality, vitality, and public standing of undergraduate liberal education and what students need from college if they are to hone the knowledge, skills, and values to become globally responsible US citizens in a diverse democracy and radically unequal world. It's also sponsored by the Democracy Commitment, a national uh, community college initiative whose goal is that every community college student graduates with an education in citizenship and democracy. We would also like to give special thanks uh, to the National Endowment for the Humanities, who funded the webinar series, which was inspired by NEH's important new initiative, The Common Good, the Humanities in the Public Sphere. This webinar series is part of a larger NEH project um, uh, called Citizenship Under Siege, a project in which AACNU and TDC joined with seven community colleges to investigate in dialogue with the larger public what often feel like intractable differences around citizenship. Uh, like all good educational uh, endeavors, uh, we have constructed the webinar series driven by a set of learning outcomes. You can see these listed on our screen. Virtus? And before you begin, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. Questions will be received by utilizing the, the chat box on the, the top right of excuse me, the bottom right of the screen. So please do not raise your hand as you can um, see up there. But um, please do feel free to write questions um, in the, that chat box that says Q&A. Um, and my colleagues will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. The last 10 minutes of the webinar has been reserved for some highly anticipated Q&A. And we promise to get to as many as we can. Um, if you have um, issues logging in, um, the email address is located at the top of the chat room um, for you to be able to, um, to email. And we will do the best that we can to help you. After the webinar, an email will be sent um, with a link to access the recording and resources. So please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Um, and we will also send a link uh, to a, for a brief um, survey. And we will also, um, and, and, and we ask that anyone attending this webinar to fill it out, um, as we would definitely appreciate your feedback. So to generate as much participant engagement um, as is feasible um, in our 60 minutes together, throughout the webinar, we will pause about three times to give prompts to spur discussion um, where you are um, and reflection. And um, with the 10 minutes for Q&A, um, we'll, we'll be with the group as a whole. So we invite you now to participate in the first of our three prompts. And uh, the first of our three prompts is, uh, we invite you to write down one burning issue about the topic of today's webinar that drew you to it. And feel free to list your questions in the chat box at the top right of the screen. 
Um, so write down one burning issue that has, um, uh, that has led you to come to this webinar. Um, and while you're doing that, we will introduce the presenters for today. So first up is Dr. Karen McTai Musil, who, is, um, who, ha who was a faculty member for 16 years before moving to national level work, and for the past 24 years has been at AACNU, where she formerly served as a senior vice president. She has directed over 20 national projects and is the author of A Crucible Moment, Civic Learning and Democracy's Future, which presents the collective wisdom of a broad con um, continuity and seeks to move civic learning from niches to norms. And as senior scholar and director of civic learning and democracy initiatives, she directs the National Endowment for the Humanities Project, Citizenship Under Siege. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Virtus. And I'd like to do the favor back for you and introduce you uh, in more extension, more um, uh, detail to the people who are listening in and looking in. Virtus has come to the Democracy Commitment on leave from his position as an assistant professor of history and African American studies at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. He's currently serving as the interim national manager of the Democracy Commitment. Virtus has been teaching writing intensive, web enhanced service learning courses for the past 10 years and has served TDC as a campus coordinator on its National Steering Committee and on the advisory board for its Economic Inequality Initiative. Welcome, Virtus. Thanks, Karen. And the third expert we have tapped for this uh, webinar series is John Soltis, who teaches journalism in the communication department at County College of Morris in New Jersey. He also co-chairs the Legacy Project an interdisciplinary initiative built on engaging students and the public on academic topics that cut across the liberal arts. Soltis has selected as a fellow, was selected as a fellow in the Carnegie Knight Initiative on the Future of Journalism Education. His work in the program resulted in a published freelance piece on the obstacles of the Nigerian Catholic community in both the New York Times and the Brooklyn Rail. Welcome, John. Thank the you final person very you'll much. Be hearing from, I'm sorry, John. And the final person you'll be hearing uh, from in this next hour is Jason Zaleski, who currently serves as the Dean of Students at Mount Wachusett Community College. Jason has been working on college campuses for the past 22 years. Prior to his appointment as dean at uh, Mount Wachusett, Jason worked at Clark University, where he served as a dialogue fellow for the Ford Foundation-funded Difficult Dialogue Project. Some of you might be familiar with that wonderful project that Ford sponsored. And in that capacity, Jason facilitated dialogues on the wicked problems of our world and taught dialogue seminars on topics including freedom, extinction, power, and liberal education. Welcome, Jason. Hi, everyone. Begin, it's good to be here. Yeah. I'll begin with the formal part of the webinar by offering a, a framing for how humanities can offer a powerful mechanism, and, uh, a powerful uh, mechanism uh, for um, discovering ourselves and engaging across contentious differences. Um, the words are, are so familiar that you can see on the screen, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. So begins the preamble to the US Constitution. But who is the we? Who is recognized as belonging to the people? And if granted citizenship by law, can one fully practice it, if curtailed by economic inequality or by racism? In a country first defined by slavery and then by continuing waves of immigration, clashes over citizenship have resounded in every century, including this one. Who can become American citizens is entangled with issues of race, religious belief, wealth, national origin, gender, language, ethnicity, to name only a few. And in such a thicket, the humanities can play an essential role. As the heart of the matter puts it eloquently, the humanities remind us where we've been and help us envision where we're going. 
In Healing the Heart of Democracy, author Parker Palmer offers a confessional tale of an entitled citizen. As a white male American, he writes, who has always been well off, the kind of person for whom this nation has always worked best, the gift of full citizenship, unquestioned and unchallenged, came to me as an accident of birth. Today I realize the magnitude of that gift, but for years I was an unconscious and ungrateful recipient because attaining citizenship required no effort from me. For most other people, citizenship is neither unquestioned nor a gift of birth. Instead, it has varying gradations, full, partial, stratified, postponed, or denied, and a snapshot of who has been deemed worthy of American citizenship and who has not over time is ample proof that clashes over citizenship is as much a national narrative as the preamble to our, our Constitution. Uh, for example, as the, as the ink was drying on the Declaration of Independence that declared all men are created equal and should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, slavery and profiting from goods made in slave states was commonplace. And ignoring his wife Abigail Adams' advice to remember the ladies, John Adams and the rest of the founding fathers excluded women from the rights white men could exercise. What Abigail had warned her husband was that if he hadn't, didn't remember the ladies, that they would foment a rebellion. And you can see on this slide that, there, that people who are denied citizenship have been, over time, organizing themselves to claim their rights to the full promise of democracy. But in, in 1790, the Naturalization Act made that harder for people who were not white, because it extended citizenship to immigrants, but restricted the privilege to people who are white and male. An 1830 federal law launched the removal of Native people from their tribal lands, first the Choctaw Nation in Mississippi, and then in 1838 the Cherokee Nation in the infamous Trail of Tears. African Americans won first, uh, their first legal recognition as citizens who could vote in 1868 with the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. However, with the end of Reconstruction, African Americans in southern states were stripped of the opportunity to practice those rights until the Civil Rights restore Movement restored them 100 years later. And in 1884, 1882, as Jim Crow was gaining ascendancy, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, followed by the even broader 1924 Asian Exclusion Act, whose restrictions remained in place until 1965. And in the same decade when Asians were kept out of the US, Europeans flooded in, especially between 1892 and 1924, leading to nearly half of all living Americans who could trace their heritage to one or more family members who came through Ellis Island, where the Statue of Liberty welcomed them. And you can see on this chart that the number, the percentage of foreign-born was higher in 1890 than it is today, but the numbers are much, much higher of people. There were 9.2 new Americans uh, in um, 1890, and today there are 39 million who were not born uh, in, this, um, in this country. And the legacies uh, from these historical decisions infect many of our contemporary debates. An earlier American identity has been both fiercely reinforced and adamantly challenged. And as you can see here, there are cyclical patterns about um, uh, limiting the we. Many who enjoy the full benefits of citizenship fear their rights and opportunities will be curtailed and feel under siege by newcomers. The latter group, by contrast, feel under siege as non-citizens or as citizens that are only partially recognized. What are the frames of mind that feed many of the conflicts and allow one group to define another group as foreign, undeserving, or less than human? Here are some that the humanities can help unravel and detoxify. Stereotyping, dehumanization, misinformation, historical amnesia, demagoguery, feeling threatened economically, culturally, or socially, and maintaining comforting isolation from the group you love to hate. 
Today, there are fierce emotional and divisive debates about citizenship. Um, and we seem to be at a boiling point, exacerbated by economic hardships. We hear stories of undocumented immigrants living in the shadows, uh, debates about walls and how high, thick, or long they should be, mass incarceration rates that have led to one in seven black men nationally to lose their right to vote, Asian workers smuggled into the country to work in sweatshops, toiling without voice and rights, individual states refusing to accept any war-ravaged Syrian refugees calls to ban Muslims entering the country and registering those already in it. And you can undoubtedly name other contentious citizenship issues in your home communities. But how can higher education move people from combative corners of the ring to engaged exchanges around the table? Well, here are just some suggestions. First, deploy the power of the humanities and humanity questions across the curriculum. With its emphasis on imagination, storytelling, and empathy, the humanities offer windows into people's lives. Their dreams, their anguish, with its grounding and historical context, it helps us understand the origins of the present. With its ethical, philosophical, and moral lenses, it prompts us to question, reflect, and care. And with its delight in human expression and variety, it introduces us to cultures beyond our own. And with its creativity, it engenders the power to reimagine what might otherwise seem intractable and inevitable. The second is design the curriculum to include a focus on citizenship in all its legislated and experienced uh, differentials, on the lived experience of being marked as either belonging or alien, on social movements to correct exclusions, all designed to expand knowledge, surface contentious issues, and foster careful examination through differing perspectives. The third thing, the way to think about um, of, of tackling all of this is to adopt pedagogies of democratic engagement. Wonderful examples you'll be hearing from, <coughs> excuse me, um, from our other speakers. Dialogues of all sorts and sizes, role playing, interviewing, filming, recording, documenting others, service learning, study abroad, community based research, reflection and journaling, <coughs> ethnic autobiographies, oral histories of families and communities. And then the fourth is carry the investigations of clashes over citizenship into multiple arenas of campus and community life through varying formats. And you'll hear some of these from particularly John and Jason. Public forums, discussions, dialogues, resident life experiential opportunities, programming within student organizations, campus-wide themes for the year, film series, art exhibits, digital formats, campus community programs, and co-designed events. I will close uh, with insights by Kristen Case, a professor of English at the University of Maine at Farmington. And I will have put up on the screen a poem of Langston Hughes, which is in poetry what she talks about. She describes the heart of the humanities classroom as occurring when students are deeply engaged with one another and listening intently. Students then experience, she says, instants of apprehension in which old worlds collapse and new possibilities are articulated. This happens as students take a step away from complacent knowing. And in such a moment, they move from clashing to creating, from badgering to learning, and through the process to reimagine who we the people can actually become. I've talked to you uh, about the many journeys that um, and differential ways in which citizens have been perceived over time. And I want to ask you now to take a moment to write down um, any examples in your own family's history or your own life when citizenship was partial, selective, I, and we only have it here and or deny, but I think we really want you to also, if you, like Parker Palmer, have felt as if it's been a gift to you that you've been unconscious of, that would be worth thinking about as well. So take a few minutes now to just do that.
And while that is going on, and for sake of time, I'm just going to continue on. Feel free to keep on typing in our chat box um, if you feel inclined to share um, the examples in which your family or you have felt um, that citizenship have been partial, selective, or denied. And we thank you for sharing if you are so inclined to do so. My family has witnessed um, when citizenship was selective. And I was born and raised in the city of Rochester, New York, and I grew up in uh, Chatham Gardens, which was a low-rise, affordable public housing complex. And we lived as a family of seven in a small three-bedroom apartment. And as a child in the early 1980s, I witnessed firsthand the crime, drugs, and poverty um, that is in that neighborhood. I also noticed that there were very few white residents. I'm a first-generation northerner, so Jim Crow and segregation was foreign to me, or so I thought. The neighborhood was predominantly African-American, and my family was poor and struggling, but we were not alone. We had neighbors who were worse off than we were, and it was a close-knit community. When I began to teach at Monroe Community College's downtown campus, I realized that I was not alone and that I shared a common experience with most of my students. My parents arrived in Rochester in August of 1963, fleeing the turmoil of the South with hopes for a bright future for their offspring. They came to the North with bachelor's degrees in biology and early childhood education, but opportunities were not open to them in Rochester as they had hoped. I mean, within a year, they found out that you can run, but you cannot hide from racism and discrimination. However, before securing low-paying jobs, they witnessed the manifestation of their pain and struggles and anger in the riots of 1964. The neighborhood had experienced the tools of de facto segregation, the redlining, blockbusting, and white flight, and Rochester is now one of the most poverty-stricken cities in the country per capita, and most of the poverty is concentrated in this neighborhood that I grew up in. The, mo the common narrative was that the uprising, the riots, caused the poverty and devastation. But my students and I discovered a different narrative. They found that it was the epilogue. Utilizing Sidious Text, which is an active learning pedagogy in which students use their senses and their observations as text, they noticed that what was once a residential black community, as you can see on the left, was wiped out and replaced with an industrial complex and was called urban renewal. The city black residents that, that once lived there were displaced and forced to move beyond the color line, even though in the north didn't have color lines, supposedly. But in, in the late 1950s, what fueled animosity, tensions, and fleeing of white residents, culminating in the uprising of 1964. So my students, after taking a city of text tour themselves, created one that shows the legacy of not the riots, but of the unjust discriminatory practices and programs in preparation to record the voices of the unheard and rewrite history. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that a riot is the language of the unheard. And my students discovered that 50 years later, voices were still unheard. They created a walking tour to engage the community and establish dialogues with the goals of discovering the historical transformation of the community through on-site study and oral history and to open up a dialogue about its future. Our history brings history to life. As more historians increasingly move away from the traditional top-down study of history and focus their research on traditionally disempowered and largely neglected groups, this, this trend lends itself well to community-based learning and research and service learning. Our history provides the opportunity for students to engage the community and enable to, as historian A. Glenn Crothers suggests, and I quote, engage more fully with historical materials to engage multiple perspectives and historical evidence. And it is hoped to gain a better understanding of the past and the process of writing history. 
The ultimate goal of the project is to meet the needs, the local needs, by, by spreading historical awareness and appreciation in order to link the classroom and the community. This will, in turn, and has created more civic-minded individuals and a more engaged academic scholarship. My students created a guidebook with their observations and the tour itself. We partnered with the Rochester Public Library, um, their local history division, and our first tourist, as you can see in the middle of the screen, was the entire eighth grade class of a local school. And then that summer of 2014, we opened it up to the community. And to date, this tour has engaged over 350 people from outside of the neighborhood engaging the unhurt voices within the neighborhood. They created stations based on their, based on their observations, and the local um, library promoted it. The media came out as well, and the lowest image you see there um, shows one of my honor students, who was about 65 years old, engaging a tourist as he was there in the streets 50 years ago. We engaged the community in dialogue, especially after, the walking, after walking the block and reflected on their interactions with the community and about its future. And the students began to lead the tours and realized that they were the social capital of their communities. It made history relevant, especially later on that very summer an uprising happened in Ferguson, Missouri. And students were able to, to process what was currently happening in the streets across the country by understanding the strange career of Jim Crow North. Moving forward, the project will be interviewing and cataloging the oral histories and creating virtual tools using, and tour, tours using tools like TripLine. I am planning as the national manager of the Democracy Commitment on creating a national initiative to collect the voices of the unheard across the country and engaging community college students um, in their communities. And you could do this um, and similar projects in your own community surrounding the, your campuses as we reflected on um, as we reflected on who is the we in we the people. And now I'm going to yield the floor to my colleague um, and the professor John Soltis for, um, from the um, County College of Morris in New Jersey. Thank you, Virtus. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, here at CCM, we have been trying a, a few different things to address some of the issues that we're talking about today. And one of the key things that I'd like to talk about is a, is a particular case study um, called the Legacy Project at CCM. And before I get there, um, it's important, I think, for us to understand that uh, for the students on the line, for the faculty on the line, um, when we talk about citizenship and democracy in the classroom, and then we try to also engage our students outside of the classroom, we shouldn't forget that this is a very unique topic for the liberal arts, for humanities, um, for social sciences as well. And in the events that we do outside of the classroom, similar to Virtus's success, we try to promote partic participatory education. We try to promote the citizenship and the democratic principles in the very events that we are presenting outside of the classroom. They're really not separate. We need to put them together. So along those lines, I'm going to give you this quick pie chart. This is not scientific, but I think it probably accurately reflects a lot of what we see on college campuses when we talk about events that try to engage our students. The large part of this chart is the message, the content. If you will, it's the speaker. So when you come together with your faculty, perhaps some student representatives and staff members, and you start thinking about how to present on citizenship and democracy on your campus, you probably spend maybe 90% of your time on choosing the right topic and also choosing the right speaker. And absolutely, guilty as charged, we do that as well. But what we're trying to really move towards, to really sort of change in how we think about these events and to get the best student engagement that we can on these vital issues is to think something a little bit more like this. 
in that the message absolutely is important, but perhaps because of citizenship and democracy being such a unique issue for the humanities, that the medium or the structure of the event actually can enhance the engagement and sort of underlying that promote the very citizenship and participatory education that we're promoting in the first place. We would hate to present on something about citizenship or about a very contentious issue and not have a dialogue with the students and the faculty who have come as well. It would almost be hypocritical in some ways to simply have one speaker simply speaking and then no sense of engagement after that. Along those lines, I, I have put together a bit of a, of a how-to, and it's also something maybe that can start a dialogue in the chat room about some successes and challenges that you've had on your college campuses. When considering this structure, um, consider the pre-event opportunities. Way before your events, your series start, you should start thinking about the literature that you might be able to give to students and also to faculty through professional development opportunities. And this could be selected readings and study guides. It could be um, you know, even just a, a emailing or notification about the, the great resources that your library might have for books and especially film screenings. We also are in the early stages at our college with the Legacy Project of developing some curricular materials for selected class, for selected faculty, even selected departments that might want to engage at the curricular level before they even come to our series. Similarly, we try, because this is um, important for the community college sector, we need to be thinking about the community from day one when we start planning these events. And in that sense, we really try not only to invite them to the events, we try to be very present in the local media as well by having some of our speakers um, perhaps be interviewed, by trying to engage with what our community needs, not just simply the students who might be commuting to campus. Before we even get to the vital event, I would also start thinking about post-event. Again, it would be a bit of a tragedy, a, a disappointment, if you didn't leave your own educational legacy. So we set up library guides. We set up websites. We film just about everything that we have for our own record so that that not only becomes a record of how we address citizenship, democracy, and other issues, but it also becomes a tool for students and faculty. Um, to, to, to access that in the future through our YouTube channels. And also, to be honest, to also engage our community beyond you know, the limits of not getting to our events. They can still be there and they can still be getting the lessons. And of course, some faculty are inspired to also have lessons um, and assignments attached to these events. The case study of the Legacy Project re it really began about three or four years ago. And I was inspired after watching a documentary by Spike Lee. Um, uh, three years ago, um, in 2013, was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and many of the important chapters of the Civil Rights Movement. And Spike Lee had a film that I had watched on TV, coincidentally, called Four Little Girls, about a really unfortunate and tragic bombing in the South in Birmingham. I was inspired to try to do something on our college campus after watching that film, and I sort of asked around and just asked if there was anything that was going to be remembering the 50th anniversary of, of many of the important chapters of the Civil Rights Movement. And quickly, when I found out that there wasn't, the Legacy Project was born. And as it says, it's this interdisciplinary initiative, and it's really built on dialogue and context. Context is a key part of it. One of my co-chairs, Professor Emily Burks, that's her very, very big sort of um, uh, word every time we come together for a meeting. She's often saying, we need to contextualize this for our students. And we had success right from the bat. We had civil rights as our first um, issue. We had a panel discussion involving civil rights leaders in the local area, some people who were personal friends of Dr. King, to come and speak. And immediately we saw the great things that had happened and also the things that needed improvement. And it often came back to the structure of the event, that medium rather than just the message. So we moved on to poetry. And we had a poetry reading and some lectures with the Beat Generation. For the entire year that we looked at genocide, we started to look at not just simply having speakers come and engage, but trying to create this sense of dialogue on campus with Q&A sessions, with film screenings. When we presented um, the ancestral king of Tibet, a young man named Trichin, who is also a college student, 
we decided to also showcase his film, his short film, before we actually engaged on the event itself. Last year, uh, last academic year, we looked at Hurricane Katrina, and we did not do it through a typical lecture. We did it through visual art by inviting a comics journalist to express his ideas and his images and what he saw down in the Gulf region of the United States during that time. And I'm just thinking, of course, this is about citizenship and democracy and some of these issues, civil rights, what happened during Hurricane Katrina about 11 years ago. These are the, the, the issues that we should be thinking about and engaging, and the structure is going to really be key for that engagement. We continue with prison reform, and then this year, and probably maybe a little bit more, is we're looking at Latin America. And again, thinking about structure, we have decided to go into a different direction by presenting our first event just two weeks ago through the performing arts and through dance by inviting Ballet Hispanico to come and give a performance that celebrates Latin culture. And then we'll move on to other issues that explore indigenous rights in Latin America, that explores poetry in Latin America, that explores cuisine and music. And each of these were really sort of going through a list of these structure considerations. A forum and a lecture, I am not in any way saying that those aren't good because we will continue to do those. But we also always work in dialogue, Q&A, poetry reading, live tweeting, which is what my journalism students often do um, during the, the actual session, survival, survivor testimonial like this Holocaust survivor Maud Dami who, was, who gave such an important and impactful presentation moderated discussions, which we had also with a, with a child soldier from the Cambodian genocide. Rather than a straight lecture, we decided that this would be better presented as an on-stage interview. Film screenings and visual arts, dance performances, cuisine, and music. I guess what I'm trying to say is to maybe think a little creatively about that brainstorming process when you get faculty in a room, students in a room, and start thinking about how to bring these important topics out of the classroom think about an interdisciplinary subject. I saw in the chat field, I believe it was Jennifer Hudson, had said, how can we get the humanities to connect with STEM on campus? Great, great issue. We're thinking about that too, and we're going to do it probably through climate change, something that the humanities can address, and certainly something that the sciences can address. After you get that subject, consider the speakers and organizations. You can't get around that. You've got to think about message. Then choose the appropriate format and consider your own legacy. I'll leave you with two quick um, points. Representation on your committee is key. This representation that you see is all of the departments that are included in our committee. You'll also see towards the end that we have a library staff member, a member of the EOF staff here, and we also expand beyond just the humanities and social sciences to include the sciences now. We are learning as we go, so we definitely are not sort of saying we have it down pat. We want to hear from you and see how we're doing. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, John. And before we move on to uh, Jason, we just we have a question for you, and we would love for you to chat it up in our chat box there. Um, and then we're going to move on um, to, to Jason's presentation. But what kinds of approaches have you used, prefer, or even think have been more effective in moving from confrontation to engaged listening and learning? Let's see what kind of answers that we can have in the chat. As we introduce Jason, um, from, uh, who is the Dean of Students at Mount Wachusett Community College. Jason. Hi, everyone. Um, and I know that our time is short, so I'm going to jump right in as John did. Um, as a community college, Mount Wachusett is mission driven to educate our students and those who live in our surrounding 29 cities and towns to become active and engaged citizens in their local, national, and global communities. For the past 11 months, we have been using dialogue as our approach uh, to help us move from confrontation to engage listening and learning. Through dialogue as a medium, our community has been able to lean in to the most challenging and divisive issues of our time. Mount Wachusett recognizes the need to develop and educate our students, but we also saw a need to focus on issues that are often difficult, complex, insidious problems that threaten our collective inclusion in this world and a sense of place on our own campus. We have always hosted events on campus covering a wide array of topics, never being afraid 
to address those most challenging issues of our time. But what we observed was something similar to the slide that you see before you. Community members responding or reacting through their unique individual lens based on their timing, temperament, tribe, training, and taste. We see the world how we have been trained to view it, and it is not easy to change our perspective or shift our paradigm. So it's not surprising that, absent a formal, intentional, and deliberate method of talking with one another, exposure to divisive or controversial issues can often lead to further polarization, stereotyping, in-group bias, blaming, circular debates, micro or macro aggressions, and ultimately increased disconnection at a time when we need to be united in our understanding of society's most complex dilemmas and social problems. Our attempt to wade deeply into these topics of great importance and complexity was causing our community to become more fractured and less vocal. As a result, our conversations risked becoming more and more superficial. On our campuses, many students um, commented that they felt voiceless in addressing the real world problems of our country and culture. We asked ourselves an important question. How can we get our students and community members to look beyond their personal lens and broaden their understanding of the world and their role as citizens in shaping and initiating real transformative change? Further, how do we talk about our society's wicked problems in ways that are inclusive, beneficial, solution-focused, and democratic. Dialogue has quickly become our preferred means of engagement. Our campus-wide strategy for talking through issues that might normally divide or silence us. For those new to dialogue as a pedagogy, or as we like to say, as an art form, dialogue is a set of communicative expectations that help frame how community members might look to address issues with each other for the common good. It is particularly important to have a mutual understanding about how to talk and engage with each other when you commit to taking on conversations that center around today's most complex social problems. Issues that have no right solution, that cannot be tested, are often value-driven, that lack objective data, or that cannot be exhaustively explained. Issues like racism, power, patriarchy, gender, poverty, income inequity, death and dying. It's even more critical to model effective dialogue given our current contextual realities and the harmful discourse that we are confronted with in our media and daily lives. We frame our commitment to dialogue using elements from many primary sources and inspirations. We included a reading uh, with this webinar uh, by Patricia Romney called The Art of Dialogue, which defines some important parameters that serve as a foundation for our commitment to using dialogue, and I just want to share uh, a few of those important distinctions. For us, dialogue is focused questioning with the goal of increasing understanding, addressing problems, and questioning thought and action. We don't want to simply ask, what do you believe? We have become most interested in asking, why do you believe what you believe? So dialogue shifts your perspective, gently, respectfully, but deliberately. It engages the heart as well as the mind. It is different from everyday conversation. It is not debate because it's not about correctness, um, expert knowledge, or competition. Anyone can engage in dialogue on any topic because all that matters is what you think and feel. Dialogue is as interested in the relationship between participants as it is in the topic being explored. How you talk is as important as what you are talking about. And Patricia Romney defines civic dialogue as dialogue in which people explore the dimensions of a civic or social issue, policy, or decision of consequence to their lives, communities, and society. When we engage in our dialogue work, we ask participants to follow the lesson of author and teacher Robert Nash. He said, first find the error in what you espouse, then the truth in what you oppose. And only then should you open your mouth to speak. On the slide in front of you are some of the dialogue agreements that we use on our campus and reflect on before all of our programming so that we can frame our time together. As a community, we have spent the last year training about 50 dialogue facilitators, faculty, staff, students, and members of our community who now help lead dialogue sessions after all of our programming. 
We have been trained by the Public Conversation Project out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Pastor Center for Politics and Public Service at Arizona State University. Dialogue is led by members of our community who have been trained as courageous advocates for encouraging others to open up and engage in truly difficult and challenging conversations that are about identity, belief systems, civic engagement, and what it really means to be an active citizen in a democracy with both agency and passion. What you see before you is a list of some of the topics and programs we have facilitated using this dialogic process as our medium to connect and talk with each other. It all starts with a question and a commitment to listen, listen and engage. In a true dialogue, participants leave with more questions than they started with. They learn from each other's stories, experiences, and perspectives. They are enriched by their exposure to others. They have been encouraged to participate. They have searched for and hopefully found a voice. And they leave with the challenge to continue the conversation beyond our program. This is a photo of our most, most recent workshop that looked at why citizens do or do not vote. Over 70 students, faculty, staff, and community members sat together and talked about the barriers to voting, the electoral process, and the issues of importance facing prospective voters today. We didn't talk about who we were voting for. Instead, we talked about why we may or may not vote. Does voting matter? We asked dialogue participants to examine these complex questions morally, ethically, philosophically, and legally. It was truly a transformative experience. Lastly, I want to share a copy of the marketing that we're using for our events, depicting the proverbial elephant in the room, and our desire to move that furniture around and have conversations that go further and deeper using dialogue as our medium. We have seen this initiative grow and have watched students transform from attendees at events to trained dialogue facilitators. Maybe even more importantly, we've seen meetings, film screenings, conduct hearings, and conversations in the hallway start to incorporate critical elements of dialogue. We hope we've started a movement and would encourage those listening to consider using dialogue to help you engage your communities to help address our society's most complex problems. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jason. Great things are coming out of Monroe Community College the County College of Morris in New Jersey, as well as Mottwachusett Community College in Massachusetts. Now we have about 10 minutes or so for um, a little Q&A session. Um, so feel free to, um, to uh, pose questions at the bottom right of your screen in the Q&A box there. Um, as we um, go through this session, I will um, answer, um, I will pose some of the questions and then they'll be voiced or answered by, um, by uh, our panel here. Um, the first one um, just asks uh, if the PowerPoint will be available after the webinar, uh, because that would be very helpful, and we will definitely make that available. Um, at the end of this webinar, um, uh, give us a couple of hours, but we will send everyone on this call, and anyone that, 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 that RSVP'd and said that they couldn't make the call, we'll send everyone an email that will have a link to the resources, uh, the recorded video, as well as a copy of this PowerPoint. Um, so please look out for that. And also in that email will be a survey for everyone to fill out. And we ask you to please fill that out, as it will definitely help us uh, moving forward in our next webinars and in the future of this project. Um, another question, or a comment, really, that says, you know, helping create space uh, when community mem members can speak um, their authentic um, truth while still maintaining a sense of community. And I can really speak to that, and I'm going to yield the floor to other um, people on the panel. But that was something that we, um, at uh, when we were doing our walking tours, uh, felt that it was very, very necessary that these people that were part of the neighborhood, and it helped that I was a part of the neighborhood too, were not on display. But, um, but that their voices, I mean, when we were going around and talking to them, no one had, especially those that had been there 50 years ago uh, during the 1964 riots, 
um, had never been asked about their, um, their experience. Um, so uh, when, we, when we realized that, a different story, a different narrative started to form. This narrative that we got, you will not find um, recorded anywhere else, not on any videos, not on any books. And, um, and it's very, very important to, for to allow them to speak their authentic truth. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, Mary Frances um, Archie's um, uh, uh, comment or question. And she asked, with the, um, with the focus in community colleges being on workforce development coupled with providing students with basic skills, how do you infuse civic engagement, especially with the, um, with the student body of students working and or taking care of families. And I'm going to yield the floor um, to either John or Jason to answer this question. Jason, did you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, I can, I can take it real quick, uh, real quickly. We, um, we are very conscious of, of the fact that, that many of our, our students are also parents. Um, and we have a parent support group uh, on campus. It's a student club and organization. Um, we partner with them, and uh, we offer uh, childcare uh, for some of our um, for our dialogue events. Uh, so we we have the option in a room very close by to to do some uh, work with kids so that um, our student parents feel comfortable attending. That's a very small solution, um, but it works. Okay. Um, and also, there's another question about um, how can we facilitate civic, uh, civ um, civil dialogue, not only within humanities, but also in STEM disciplines? In other words, what can the humanities teach STEM, and how can we work towards STEAM, which is incorporating the arts with um, the science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics? Very interesting question. Yeah, th this is John. I can take that one real quick. So we're in the early stages of doing this, but I think that they are connected in many ways, for sure, especially when you talk about humanities and the sciences. In many ways, when we're talking about art, um, when we're talking about um, many of the different disciplines and departments that are represented in a traditional liberal arts division, the, the byproduct of that and the reason for these arts is often going to be tied to science in many ways, and especially even just the theme of this this webinar on citizenship and democracy. Um, you can think about the issue of climate change, for example, in that you could facilitate a discussion with faculty on campus in the sciences um, to understand the science um, behind climate change. And then in the same dialogue, to try to make it a bigger picture for students and faculty themselves during an event series, you could also look at the real repercussions at the community level, at the societal level, of what happens when climate change is ignored. And this is really an issue of citizenship and forgotten communities when you talk about um, communities that live near um, very vulnerable, low-lying areas, for sure. So I think that you know a dialogue between professors like, for example, Dr. Jill Shenham, who's on the call today from my college, CCM, um, with her department and the sciences, it, there's definitely dialogue that can go back and forth. And each faculty can walk away with a pretty good understanding and learning outcome achieved. Um, and that additional sort of connection between the humanities and sciences. So I would encourage that one as a very good interdisciplinary initiative. Okay, and um, and if we have any more questions, if um, if if uh, because I'm having some issues in my questions box, uh, if someone else can read uh, uh, the next question, I believe from Adam uh, Grismondi. It says, for anyone looking, oh, um, no, I'm not sorry. I don't see that. Well, there, there's a question here I'll, I'll just ask for the, for the sake of time, which is um, tips for facilitating dialogue when things heat up. Um, and I'll, I'll answer quickly. Um, one of the things that, that we do um, is we do spend some time uh, before, uh, as we start every dialogue session, with our ground rules, and um, I use a handout um, dialogue agreements that everyone um, gets when they when they walk in the door. And as the the moderator, so to speak, I make sure that I'm in the room early and I greet every single person that comes in personally. 
Um, and, and that sets a tone of, of dialogue as being a place where everyone matters um, and where their participation and, and presence matters. Um, so we, we have some dialogue agreements around what you do when you're speaking and listening. Um, one of the things I always remind participants is we don't listen very well in our culture, um, but we do uh, wait to talk. Um, and waiting to talk and listening are two different things. Um, and so you should be asking yourself questions. If you're feeling a response uh, or feeling angry or feeling upset, um, you should be talking with yourself as you're listening about why you may feel the way you feel at that moment. Um, and you know, we, we, just, we just practice and, and do some modeling in the beginning. So we try to, to really scaffold our dialogues with uh, modeling of appropriate behavior to try to avoid that. When it happens, sometimes we take a break. Um, a small group, um, in a small group dialogue circle, we may say, okay, let's just take a deep breath. Um, or we have some other, in our training, we do like a, a breath in, and then everybody whips around the circle and says how they're feeling in that moment with just one breath. So it's a couple of words, very brief, and it, and it sort of resets, and then we, we go forward. So there's some good training there. Um, there's some good ground rules that we set up in advance, um, but it happens, um, and, and, we, and, and it's okay. People are passionate. Passion and anger uh, sometimes go hand in hand, and, and we just try to qualify what they are and work through it. And, and Virtus, um, uh, this is John again. David Bodery had a question. I can go real quick with this. What mistakes can you help us avoid based on your experiences? Just one maybe thought is um, we kind of set up, and it's more of a mental sort of scale that we have about what type of events and speakers we want to have engage our students on these issues. And on one side of the scale, we put like motivation. And on the other side, we put like academic research paper. And we try not to be um, either of those. Um, we try not to have simply uh, an event that is motivational or activist in nature. And then also, we don't necessarily, it's not the right um, uh, event for us to simply present an academic research paper. That is better for like a professional development or a, a, a single course. We find we try to be in the middle of that, to be both um, motivational and inspiring in some ways, but also to sort of be rooted in academia. Um, and it's an ongoing discussion. And the only thing that, that I would add, just a quick aside, uh, we, we made, um, I think we made an assumption that in the very beginning of our work 11 months ago, that our students may struggle as facilitators. Um, they're the best facilitators we have. Um, they are, um, you know, they, they, they have, are wonderful facilitators. We were afraid to overwhelm them with facilitation. Um, they, they are fantastic. And, and I think another issue, we were afraid that we wouldn't get people to show up. They do. Um, we wouldn't get people to talk. They will. Um, and an hour would be way too long and we couldn't fill the time. It's never a problem. Um, it, it's never a problem. So, so don't underestimate the power of your community to facilitate these dialogues. Um, and trust me, um, use the field of dreams analogy. People, are, people feel invisible. And when you create uh, a container that, that makes them feel visible, and for some of our students and community members, the dialogue is the only time where anyone sees them, um, where they have an opportunity in a very democratic way to talk and participate um, and be a citizen, be an active participant in their own life. Um, and that's very, very powerful to watch. This is Karen. I, I think we are getting down to one minute left. So I just wanted to thank uh, very much uh, John and Jason and Virtus and all of you on this webinar for participating. Uh, we wanted to let you know that we have uh, some resources on our URL page um, that, that you can see here. But I was so impressed by uh, the flow of exchanges during this webinar among you. And someone asked whether there'd be a printout av available for those. So we will, I can't answer that technologically, but I will. I th certainly thought, oh, I'm going to be uh, combing this for very good uh, ideas for references. And I also wanted to thank you so much for sharing the rich and personal stories of your own life and your family's lives. 
I think that is one way. Someone asked, uh, how do you how do you have people engage um, and and when they're quiet and not just sit there? I mean, some of that is really asking people and listening and wanting to hear their stories because I think those are so rich and they do put a human face uh, on everything that makes uh, the abstractions. Uh, it helps us suspend those till we can understand what's behind the abstraction and whether the abstraction actually fits anymore. We want to invite you to, um, uh, to let people know and certainly come yourself if you haven't yet registered for our next two webinars, one on the income inequality and the cost of citizenship, and the last one, I want my country back, immigration, race, and citizenship. So I'll just end with a um, quote from Terry Tempest Williams. We talked a lot about the mind and the heart of, of it's not just the message, but the, but the medium. Um, and Terry Tempest Williams, a wonderful nature writer, um, activist, uh, author of Refuge, and a lot of other uh, books. She says in, a, in an essay called Engagement, the human heart is the first home of democracy. It's where we can embrace our questions. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen with our whole beings and not just our minds and offer our attention rather than our opinions? And do we have enough resolve in our hearts to act courageously, relentlessly, without giving up ever, trusting our fellow citizens to join with us in our determined pursuit of a living democracy? So again, I want to thank you for the work you've done. Uh, and I uh, am eager to continue to hear from you about what's happening on your campus. I know that both Virtus and I are very interested in, in learning more about